Awesome. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's good to see you, um, even if it's another meeting on Zoom. We are the Visiting Scholar Committee is excited about the upcoming Visiting Scholar. He's um, somebody that I didn't know. I didn't know. I, I've never met him. I didn't know of his work. Um, but I've enjoyed beginning to read this most recent book that he's published. And he's a professor at Middlebury College. He's a professor of uh, theology and ethics and um, also a friend of Kathy's from seminary. So there's a nice personal connection between the scholar and Kathy Beach. Um, I have just begun reading the book, American Liturgy. It's a quite short book. I assume everybody here has gotten an email saying that Foggy Pine Bookshop will give you a little discount if you want to go buy it. Uh, I'll be leading these three classes and I'm just going to, uh, I've started reading the book. I've gotten through the first 60 or 70 pages and then um, I thought we'd just split it into thirds and talk about each third as we go. I, I'll offer a few, a little bit of um, introductory framing comments to help those of you who haven't had a chance to look at the book uh, understand sort of what the what he's up to in this book and then we can focus on the specific chapters in each of these three weeks so as how many people out there have had the book it's hard for me to see in the fellowship hall but so there's a good bit of us who don't but maybe a handful that do is that right there we go is that morris Hey. Yes, thank you, Davis. <laughs> oh, I wish, I, were with, I wish we were all together in person. Um, so this book is, uh, he sets it up as, it's, the title of it is American Liturgy, and the subtitle is Finding Theological Meaning in the Holy Days of U.S. Culture. So um, it, he sets it up with a, there's a very, uh, one of, I guess America's most famous theologians of the 20th century um, is our, we're, we're, well, two of them, I guess, the Niebuhr brothers and um, right. Oh my gosh, now I'm blanking. Which one was it, Reinhold or Richard, who wrote The Christ Against Culture? Richard. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Great. Um, Richard Niebuhr has famously set up this uh, question for theological uh, reflection by the church about how we should think about our identities as Christians uh, within the church when we are also living within a um, culture and nation that may or uh, may not be suited toward our Christian identity. And uh, so the, the book in many ways is, is thinking through um, these the rhythms of, of the holy days of American uh, national cultural identity and how should we think about those given our uh, loyalties to God and the church and our theological uh, convictions? Should we be critical of some of these um, holy days? Should, could they, the holy days, uh, uh, teach us something uh, about the church that, that show the sort of shortcomings of the church? Could we uh, think more deeply about some of these uh, important holidays in our calendar, given uh, our Christian um, convictions. And so it's it, it's not a book that's against American culture for American culture, it's, all, it's both of those things. And it's, I think, um, insightful and sometimes quite surprising, like especially the chapter on Super Bowl Sunday, which I didn't know how in the world he was gonna try and make that something that would inform us uh, positively about our Christian identity, but he does. and. Uh, it's it's an it. I think it's an interesting book, and it, it it should lead to some good discussion. I hope so. I don't have an agenda. I'm not a theologian. I'm not an ethicist. I'm a biblical scholar, as you know, and so uh, I'm open to to chatting about these various holidays and uh, thinking with James Calvin Davis and um, perhaps. Uh, using his book as a springboard for new thoughts that he doesn't develop. So the just in case you're going to get the book and look at it, I, I was thinking that we would look this week at the introduction, which I've already sort of 
been talking about. That's where he sets up this framework of, um, should we think about Christ uh, against culture, the church against culture, the church embracing culture, or uh, the culture um, sort of offering critical insight for the church to, to think through its identity uh, in more complex and, and deeper ways. So the, I thought we would look at the introduction in the first six chapters today. There are 23 chapters total. And then for next week, um, which I haven't even read much beyond those first six chapters. So I'm going to be reading along with you if you have the book. And uh, the next um, chapter seven through 15, uh, and then 16 through 23, sort of uh, more or less evenly breaks up the book into thirds. And it's a very readable book. He's, he's not... Um, there are very few footnotes and uh, very little engagement with scholarship. They they're read almost like um, sermons that, and he mentions that in the intro that a number of them, I think did originate in sermons that he preached at his, he, he's a PCUSA minister. And um, yet he goes to a congregationalist church in Vermont. He teaches at Middlebury uh, in Vermont. Anybody have any? Questions before we dive in? Well, I thought I'd, uh, from the introduction, I just thought I'd read a couple of pages, a couple of quotations um, to give us a sense of his starting point, and then we can go and consider the holidays that he looks at in, in the chapters. So he defines theology on page two, if you have the book. Um, this is a quotation uh, in that in the section that begins on page two. Christian theology is the collective project of understanding ourselves, the human community, the world, and the cosmos in relation, in relation to God through the interpretive lens of what Jesus Christ reveals to us about God and in conversation with the best sources of knowledge available in our time and place. So that's kind of a lot um, of uh, words in one sentence, but uh, what he's getting at is several things there, I think. Uh, Christian theology is a collective project, is the first thing he says. So he wants to think about theology not as something private, that we uh, sort of hold these private convictions to ourselves, but something that we have in, in common, something that the church on the whole develops. It is a, um, a, a communal, public, and more than individual conversation about uh, ourselves, our community, the world, God, whom we know uh, primarily through Jesus Christ as Christians, and um, that we think theologically uh, not uh, from multiple sources of knowledge that are not ahistorical, but he says, again, um, in conversation with the best sources of knowledge available in our time and place. So among the various sources for thinking theologically, he's going to draw on uh, the Bible, of course, which is unsurprising, but also um, other areas of knowledge that we've developed, and uh, that is in keeping with our Reformed tradition as well. And also the sources of knowledge that are available in our time and place is the way he words it here, but he also means by that um, that we understand these sources of knowledge both from the Bible and our experience and other um, sort of disciplines and fields of knowledge creation, that we understand them as having been rooted in a particular time and place. That is that uh, we can see um, God as inspiring uh, us as we have thought theologically over the centuries, but that, that those thoughts have always occurred by people who are situated in particular times and places. And we need to understand um, those times and places in order to understand the sort of uh, knowledge and the, the extent to which that, that knowledge can be a source for us to think theologically. He then talks about reform theology. So he does consider himself a reform theologian, which we in the PCUSA are rooted deeply in the reformed tradition. And on in the next couple pages of the introduction, he goes into some major emphases in reformed theology on the sovereignty of God, by which reformed thinkers mean, this is a quotation, the conviction that God is a creator, redeemer, and sustainer of the entire cosmos. He says reformed theology takes seriously the reality of sin as an important dimension of the human 
condition, and uh, that the and that Reformed theology emphasizes the necessity of divine grace for the redemption of the world. And the result is a Reformed vision of piety in which gratitude is lived in and for the world instead of withdrawing from a world considered dangerous to faithfulness. Reformed Christians express their gratitude for divine grace by living faithfully in the world and in so doing testify to the goodness of God who offers the gift of reconciliation to the world. So that is um, sort of the framework for James uh, Davis's book that he wants to think um, and, and encourage people to live faithfully in the world. And one of the things that defines the rhythm of our lives as Americans uh, and American Christians are the holy days of our, um, our holidays of our year. So he begins with New Year's Day. So I'd like to hear from you about uh, New Year's Day. Is this an important holiday to you? What, what do you, what do we do on New Year's Day? And how, uh, if you haven't read the book, or if you have, uh, you could offer insights from, or you could imagine, I think, pretty easily how he might think theologically about New Year's Day. So is New Year's Day an important holiday for you? comment on that. I can st I'll start. I go to bed at nine o'clock and I get up the next <laughs> morning and I the calendar. <laughs> I guess maybe it's no longer an important holiday for me. I don't think theologically about it, so I'm really eager to hear what you have to say about that. <laughs> Davis, this is Betty. Um, I started when my children, I guess, were able to write. And so as most of you, you know, we're supposed to have the turnip greens and the hopping john and all that traditional food. But Marshall and Jay and Susanna and I all took a piece of paper and wrote down four or five things that we wanted to accomplish in the new year. And then we would fold them. Nobody looked at them, put them in an envelope wrote the date of the new year on the outside. I stuck them in my desk and the following New Year's Day, we would open them and discuss either that we had or had not <laughs> accomplished those things. And in our moving, I just found the last four that we ever did together. And Jay was in uh, getting his master's so his first thing was complete thesis. And then Susanna was at ASU, but it's nice that I kept them. And those are the last four that we have. And Jay, our son has started that with his family. So that's kind of a traditional, not very theological, I guess. Well, I mean, I think uh, that's part of the book. The surprise of the book is his <clears throat> ability to think theologically about things that, um, you know, we may not, initially associate with theological thinking. Um, that's neat. Did he, did he finish his master's? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Historic <laughs> preservation at the University of Georgia. Nice. Anybody else have uh, traditions that are important on New Year's Day? Uh, Jane here. Um, I have a wooden calendar in my house that I change each month. And this probably just highlights how I look at New Year's Day because the symbol for New Year's Day is a baby. Oh. And I think of it as a new beginning. And I would say that that's probably theologically how I look at it and how I look at it in just my day-to-day -day living. January 1st is a, a new beginning for me each year. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can do better this year. <laughs> And I did last year. So. I, th I think that's commonly the way people think about New Year's, right, with the resolutions and such, that this is a, a chance for uh, st stopping in time and imagining a new uh, moment in, where we can step back and think about how do we want to be different than we are? Do we want to work on any? 
anything, set any goals, but also look back on the past year. Does anybody spend time on New Year's Day looking back? David, my connection. <laughs> David, I have something that I make the family do. So a little under duress sometimes, but they play along. <laughs> uh, in November, I sent out 20 questions that they have to answer. And I started this uh, several years ago called the Harris Poll. <laughs> <laughs> first question every year is, what is something you accomplished in the year ending and what is something you hope to accomplish in the year beginning and then it has other things that are on it but that one sort of lends itself to what you're talking about mm -hmm. from making them reflect and challenge them to do something we have a little a tradition at our house that um it, it's sort of a new year slash christmas so it's not purely new year's but when ryan was in preschool I think it was his four-year-old preschool class. The teachers gave him this clear glass ornament with this these instructions. And the instructions were at every year at the end of the year for him to think back on what he would have considered to be the highlight of the previous year. And then write it on a tiny slip of paper and stick it through that little narrow hole <laughs> that's in the top of that ornament. And he did it every year through all the way through last year when he, his final year of high school. And um, if we can get the pieces of paper out, which is a little bit of a challenge, <laughs> it has, it's always a really neat ritual at the beginning of a new year to look back on all of those previous years and to see what the highlights of the year were. So that's a neat tradition that um, somebody gave to us. We don't get to take credit for coming up with it. Yeah, that's neat. So, uh, James Davis says that uh, what we're often doing when we're thinking in, in these ways around the new year is we're thinking about God's providence and we're thinking about how God, uh, how, how there's a, a large sort of project to our lives that we are projecting ourselves into the future and always based on sort of where we've come in the past, but that we don't often take time to step back and, and consider and evaluate that sort of larger project of our lives and New Year's Day gives us a chance to do that. And so it's an opportunity to think about God's providence and how do we imagine what that providence is? Do we imagine that God is sort of uh, managing, micromanaging even our lives? There's a famous, I mean, there's a line from a, one of our confessions, Heidelberg, maybe I can't remember. Uh, this just popped in my head. I can't. The line about not a single hair will fall from our head. Is that from Westminster Confession? Or I can't remember. Maybe Kathy or Russ remembers better than I do. But I think it's not Heidelberg or Westminster. It's one of those early ones. But anyway, that not the idea that not a hair will fall from our head without God knowing it. Um, but then what does that mean? How are we imagining God when we imagine that? And how does God relate to both uh, the good things that happen in our lives and the bad things that happen in our lives? And um so I think the chapter on um, New Year's Day is interesting uh, for thinking uh, through some of these um, options. And in the end, he, are, he, he suggests that we think about God not as a, like a big sort of um, controlling machine over all the, the details of our lives, but instead that we think about uh, that, that we are rather agnostic about what he calls special providence, where God is um, there sort of directly behind as an agent behind uh, every particular thing that might happen in our lives. But, uh, and, and he says instead that we should have a, a be, have a more humility than that would imply and have more of a God-centered piety than, our, than a piety that's uh, rooted in these particular experiences um, that we have and that we find evidence in, at the end of the day for God's providence in the love and care and friendship and community that sustains our lives without um, making, uh, without being certain about God's fingerprints in every part uh, of our lives, which 
I don't know if that helps you, Morris, makes you want to celebrate New Year's Day more, but <laughs> probably inspired me. I think it was a good, a good frame um, for considering what we often do on New Year's Day, which is not only eat collards for dollars, but also um, think about the larger project of our lives. Any uh, further thoughts about New Year's Day? Well, the next uh, holiday, what's the next holiday? You tell me, after January 1? Martin Luther King. Yeah, Martin Luther King Day comes next in our calendar. And this was a, um, this was a, a good chapter, I think, for uh, timely concerns uh, that we're all have faced in the last couple of years, especially with um, George Floyd and other events around Black Lives Matter and, and calls for justice and uh, the obviousness, I think that we live in a, in a world that, uh, and in a country that doesn't quite live up to Martin Luther King's dream. And that at the same time, Martin Luther King has become such a highly celebrated sort of saint in American culture, but not always um, in ways that are rooted in what King was really aiming to do and that he has often uh, been being uh, sentimentalized for someone who uh, advocated for some sort of uh, vague um, general uh, common humanity and not for uh, critiquing real injustice that exists in this world and in our nation in particular. And um, so th this chapter, it's the first chapter on New Year's Day is about providence. Uh, the second chapter is largely about justice and uh, it gets much more at how uh, often the church does not live up to its commitments to justice. And that um, considering Martin Luther King and Mar what Martin Luther King Day is about is an opportunity to uh, um, reflect on the church and the, ch and the church in the United States in particular. And here, uh, he, uh, especially sort of evangelical, white evangelical Christianity comes under specific um, fire in this chapter for um, being quite uh, susceptible to certain things that prevent uh, Christians from thinking about justice in, in uh, important ways that he thinks that, that uh, there's a certain kind of American, especially evangelical Christianity. But I mean, I think we all know that it, it also seeps into our Presbyterian church as well, where people are often thinking individualistically and imagining themselves to be uh, colorblind and uh, unaware then of, of racial problems, problems of racism in our country, and then susceptible to certain um, dog whistles from uh, he, those he refers to as silver spooned politicians who claim to have people's backs, but do not um, in the end work for either them or the justice that Martin Luther King day should help us to think through. So he, he warns in this chapter against domesticating King's message and movement and uh, celebrating him as a mere patron saint of sentimental love, as opposed to um, being committed to the kind of justice concerns that he has, um, that, that he had and that uh, he should foster in the church. So I don't know if anybody wants to say anything about this chapter struck me as one um, that, that was rather obvious, uh, I think, and important, but um, a little different than New Year's Day because we tend, I mean, Dr. King was such a theological thinker that we tend to think about him, I think, as being an important source for us as we think theologically about social political issues. And so this chapter didn't, didn't have much uh, in the way that, in, in that, much that surprised me, but I thought it was insightful. Oh, Kathy Beach says it is in Heidelberg. I did remember that correctly. <laughs> um, does anybody have any special things that they do for Martin Luther King Day? As a North Carolina State employee, you get the, to get Monday off, <laughs> but then you lose Columbus Day. So that's the way they, they figured it out. It's, and 
So no, um, now when I was living in Raleigh, they did have, um, they would have uh, activities over at the state capitol. People would speak and do something like that, but as the most time it was, it was not. So quiet day usually. In recent years, it's, it's been a day of service. Community service. Community service. Mm -hmm. In a lot of places. In South Georgia, a lot of small towns, including Statesboro, where we live, they have parades. For a number of years, I would read the letter to the Birmingham jail on Martin Luther King Day. I haven't done that in several years, but uh, it's so short and powerful and compelling that it's easy um, practice to do. Kathy, I have a question for you and maybe for Davis. Since Martin Luther King's holiday, birthday celebration, whatever, is on the Monday, which is, of course, after a Sunday church service, I just wondered how many ministers, preachers, whatever, ever tried to, on the Sunday before, incorporate into their sermons any of the ideas of Martin Luther King's theology. You ever learned that in school or anything? I don't know if I was taught that in seminary, but that's been something that I've tried to make important okay. most every one of those Sundays, different ways. Sometimes the sermon has the focus. Often the prayers have had a focus, or maybe we've tried to sing something that would help us sort of okay. connect to that. But uh, I think it's important to acknowledge it. I, mean, I think for a lot of the reasons that he articulates in the book, right? That um, helping us to acknowledge where we, how we, we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And also there's every year, I imagine most of us know, but there's um, one of the most important speakers that, Appalachian State invites to campus every year is the Martin Luther King Day speaker. And I mean important in terms of the stature of the person who's invited. And it's all, it has been often in the Convocation Center, so quite a large um, uh, venue for, so just in case you don't know, if you're new or uh, not as connected to the university, there's always a, a big speaker in the winter, which means that that uh, speaker has often been canceled and rescheduled because it's the winter in Boone. And so uh, the, the lecture usually happens in January or February, but um, often has been canceled and rescheduled for later in the year or the next year. But anyway, we um, so be on the lookout. I don't know who the speaker is this year. If I've seen it, I've, I've forgotten, but that's always a big event in our uh, area. All right, the, ch the third chapter is maybe the most surprising. This is a Super Bowl Sunday. Why God Loves Football is the title of the chapter. <laughs> Anybody have any ideas about why God would love football? How can he not? <laughs> Isn't that his thinking? Right. How can he not? Together. Is, 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 did you say getting together? Yes. Yeah. But there are other things that bring us together. So what is it about football specifically? Well, if you pull for ACC schools, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> But isn't it entirely an American sport? That version of it, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking we could have a much bigger conversation about why God, why God might not love football. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he tells about how God cannot suffer through a long baseball game with no kids. So I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's he, th this was um I think one of the chapters where he uh is you, you can get a sense of his humor better than others. Lots of uh, sarcastic sort of quips at other sports and also a little tongue in cheek I think too about how God loves football. Um he but he does make the case that um like Mary said, I think um, it does bring us together in a way that very few other sports do. It is, like Betty said, a very American sport, but it is also, you know, one of the most commonly watched events of the year where, um, like the end of Dallas or MASH or whatever, there's just few moments in time where Americans are watching something in real time together to such a grand uh, scale as we have in Super Bowl Sunday. And that's not only because people like football, but right, because people like the commercials or uh, people throw parties and, and, but it's not only, the chapter is also about football. I mean, he talks about uh, Friday nights in small towns that bring communities together around the football game or Saturday and college and, and um, teams that, uh, that create a sort of culture around them. He refers to having grown up in Appalachia and in Western Pennsylvania and being a Steelers fan and how um, how the, the Rust Belt was hit so hard that by the time he was growing up in the 70s and 80s, so many people who had lived in and around Pittsburgh and these various sort of Rust Belt cities had moved into different parts of the country trying to find jobs once um, jobs had left the area and how uh, that led then to Steelers sort of showing up, Steeler fans showing up at and getting a reputation for being um, good, uh, having good attendance at foreign, at like when they not foreign, but when the away away games. That's the word. Um, so th I thought that 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 part of the chapter was an interesting way to think through the specific history of Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania and Northern Appalachia in relation to. Um, football and a sense of camaraderie among the fans and community. And, uh, but he also does in the chapter, pay attention to the, how football can at the same time reveal some of the worst things about our humanity. Um, but he says uh, some of the best too, and, and in ways that bleed over into other sports, but um, at its worst, we know football can be a celebration of violence and uh, can foster um, an unhealthy spirit of competition and narcissism um, and the economic problems with professional sports in this country as well and, and sort of crass ethics or, or lack of ethics that um, doesn't make decisions about what to do on the basis of uh, understandings of good and evil, but instead on um, the basis of what can make money or what can uh, win games and including uh, he has a couple of digs at Tom Brady and cheating and the Patriots and other things. <laughs> this one, uh, maybe I, I, at some point, somebody in our visiting scholars group, I think it might've been you, Betty, who um, found a bio of him that listed a title of the book, of this book at one point was going to be Why God Loves Football. And obviously that didn't end up being the title. And I think that's probably a good thing that that didn't end up being the title. <laughs> so uh, if anybody, anybody want to add anything more, especially those who have read the book about this chapter. Yeah, it was my favorite chapter because, because of the humor, I guess, and it shows you something about him as well as anything else. I, I came across with the more of the celebration of the American spirit and, um, and, and the American person, American man, you know, as being a, something glorious that God had created. Yeah. That was Anne? Yeah. I didn't know you were in there, Anne. I can't see you. Me, yes, Anne. <laughs> um, Yes, uh, another good thing in the, that was in the chapter, I think, was he said, we tend to, when we start thinking about God and speaking about theology, we tend to focus on sober topics that are serious and 
he said, um, we, we need to be aware of how God touches our lives in entertainment and in levity and jokes and uh, recre recreation. And so that was another thing that he talked about in this chapter. It says my internet connection is unstable. Am I, am I breaking up? We can hear you. You paused a couple times earlier, but we can hear you fine. I, I was going to say that I um, found this chapter surprising okay. in a pleasant Great. way. That um, I, I didn't expect this to be his take on the Super Bowl, <laughs> on Super Bowl Sunday. And um, and then I guess I'm hopeful for his time with us that that he will be able to help us think more theologically about, I don't know if the Super Bowl is not an everyday thing. It's a pretty big event, but like you were just saying, Davis, that he um, is helping us to, to think theologically and to think about God in places and situations. Like we might think about God on Martin Luther King Sunday. Oh, we're supposed to think about God that day, but on the Super Bowl, I don't think, you know, that was stretching me, but this is in a good way. Like it's a good thing. Um, yeah. So. I just, I, I really appreciated him taking a very American day, like the Super Bowl and saying, how do we, how do we think about this theologically? I, I, I think there's something really good and also very Presbyterian about that, which I appreciate. <laughs> yeah. And what the church has often done with Super Bowl is to make it S-O-U-P-E-R and to say, uh, instead of doing that thing that everybody else is doing, we're going to do what the church should be doing, which is help feeding people in the middle of winter when people need food and a, uh, a bowl of soup. And, and that's great. And he doesn't say anything about that in this chapter, but it is a, a very different way to think about that day than just to offer an alternative from the church to the Super Bowl, but to think about what's happening in the Super Bowl. I served in a, speaking of that, I remember serving in a church and on that day specifically, you were invited to wear your team jersey. <laughs> so I could look out at the congregation and see like people in team jerseys. And it was a little shocking at first to not see people in <laughs> kind of church clothes, but instead to see people in um, yeah, sports jerseys. But I think when you started talking about kind of connection and connectional, you know, people of course were gracious about it because they're in a church and they're not like, being <laughs> ugly, kind of, yeah, not that ugliness, but instead of kind of that spirit of fun around healthy competition, I guess. Yeah. I think Anne said that this was her, the Super Bowl was her favorite chapter. I think my favorite chapter was the next one on, anybody want to guess what comes next after Super Bowl? Yes, Valentine's Day. Yeah. So um, in this chapter on Valentine's Day, he, he uh, I, talks about different conceptions of love and how we should think theologically about love and how Valentine's Day is primarily about romantic or intimate love and that this is something that... Um, the church has not always done a very good job with that. Um, he starts off by saying what the church, what the church has tended to do a good job with is to talk about, uh, and he used the Greek word agape for love. And he used the good Samaritan story as the story that teaches us about, um, agape love. So that would be, well, what, what does it mean when you call someone a good Samaritan? What do you, what might they have done? Something good to help someone else. Something to help someone else. Yeah, so something for someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agape love. Yeah. So the, the Good Samaritan does something to help someone else. Sorry. Someone else who is not like them. Yeah. Good Samaritan. Right. Typically, uh, yeah, like typically uh, a sort of selfless act for someone that uh, one doesn't know, that doesn't, you, you don't necessarily have any sort of connection to that person. You don't have anything to gain from extending 
the help that you're extending to the person in need, uh, a kind of selfless, um, self-giving of love to a, a, a stranger. And not only in a way that sort of won't, doesn't obviously provide you any benefit, but might even cost you something. Like in the story when he takes the man to the inn and pays for him to have care and promises to come back and get him. So going above and beyond in self-sacrifice for another um, with whom what one doesn't have much of a, of a connection, if at all. So that's one type of love. And that's one way to think about love. And here he says um, that Valentine's Day might help us think not only about other uh, types of love that we should be thinking theologically about as the church, but um, also how other types of love might, um, well, one of the interesting th things about the chapter is, is that he's asking this question, does romantic love or friendship love intimate love of family and friends, people that we know and have relationships with, do those pose obstacles to our ability to experience and exercise um, agapic love? Because you can see what I hope where, where that question is coming from. If we're too attached to our family and friends, would does that hinder our ability to- That's, that's where we learn from. I mean, mm -hmm. learn from- your family. I mean, not everybody's not going to come out and say, "Oh, I love that." Everybody they learn and become very, you know, accepting and giving in their own families. And as I wrote at the bottom of one of the pages, is one form possible without the other? Yeah. And I. Yeah. I would think not. Yeah. I mean, I think that there may be times where we can imagine a uh, conflict between one's loyalties. I mean, every time that you turn toward one person, there is someone else that you're turning away from. But at the end, he makes the argument that you're exactly the, the case that you're making that, um, in fact, it, it is our love of family and friends that, that teaches us how to love those who are not our family and friends. And yet it is an interesting issue. Uh -huh. I mean, the whole, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, in families, you have ones that you do not like, but, uh, you know, or different. And um, <laughs> you, well, have to, not. you have to, and they don't <laughs> rub, they rub you the wrong way, but you still love them and you still have to, reach out to them and give to them. And if you don't, if you can't do that, you can't move out into the whole community. So I think sometimes families are learning grounds <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> that's, that's right. And the church I think is similar too, right? We, I mean, we're not, everybody in the church isn't best friends with one another. And that's sort of what we learn in church is how to be in community with people who are, uh, who we do have close relationships with, but also others whom, with whom we don't. Uh, another point that he makes in this chapter that I thought was really insightful was about how uh, once we begin to focus on uh, friendship love and talk about it and think theologically about uh, friendship, love, love among friends, whether intimate romantic friends or um, not, is that it, it, it leads us to think about uh, sort of authentic love and Christian love uh, in terms of the sort of uh, virtues that it cultivates in us and others, as well as the kinds of relationships that we want to see in the world. And he says that that, that is a healthy uh, move for the church to make beyond the unhealthy focus on um, particular types of uh, families that um, are seen as, as Christian or not by some or particular kinds of expressions of sexuality that are seen at times as, so moving beyond those sorts of debates to think about um, love as, um, the, as cultivating a certain kind of virtue and fostering a certain kind of relationship uh, among people. That is that 
that this way of thinking will lead us to evaluate relationships on the basis of the virtues that they cultivate rather than the particular form that any relationship might take, which I think is a good message for the, the church. Let's see, it's 1047. Are we supposed to wrap up at 1045? Does anybody know? Probably. Yes. Okay. Well, um, then next time we can begin with, uh, there are two chapters that we didn't get to that I thought we might talk about today, but um, they're the first day of spring and then Easter. And these are some, uh, some good chapters. So we'll start uh, with that next time and we'll get as far as we can and we'll just keep proceeding through these holidays. And so think about the holidays of the American calendar um, over the next week and especially the ones in the uh, spring and into the summer. Uh, including Mother's Day, Memorial Day, and Father's Day, and we'll be, um, we'll talk about those when we meet again next week. Thank you all for being here. Would anybody like to close us in prayer? I will. Thank you, Betty. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the very many blessings that you have bestowed upon all of us. We ask you especially to be with those that are not as blessed. Give us the mind and the heart to think about the things we discussed today. Um, we thank you for the visiting scholar committee and the support that Rumpel has given us. We hope that Dr. James Calvin Davis visiting with us will give a lot of people more information to think about. And as we discuss on Valentine's Day to spread the love of Christ Help us to go out and be kind and good and always do the right thing. In thy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Betty. Thanks so much, everybody. Hope you have a lovely holiday weekend. It's a holiday.